I'm Klaus. I'm a bit an outsider here because, as similar to Geoffrey, I'm a computer science guy. I'm not an artist or I'm not in this, in this area. So I have a very unemotional look at born digital content and digital art, which helps to, well, do things like we do. <laughs> so the, what, what I'm presenting, preservation and access of born digital content, I don't, I just say content, for us it's anything is kind of a content. So emulation as an alternative preservation strategy, and in particular as an access strategy, is not a really new idea. So you have Rothenberg started the first flame war about emulation versus migration, 95, I think. And there are lots of em emulators available. If you Google, uh, there are zillions of open source emulators from hobbyists to more professional uh, software. So the question is, how hard can it be? So 20, 20 years now, and still uh, not many emulators in production, especially in the art community. So this is because, well, it's technically complex, especially for non-IT experts. You, well, you have to deal with complex, not very well documented software. You have to deal with old software, which you're maybe not used to use, and a lot of technical details which make it very difficult, which leads directly to the second point, it did not scale well. So in the earlier days, when you use the emulation, uh, well, you set up um, a single computer um, which ran a game or whatever, and well, yes, that was it, but it, wasn't, it did not scale in a, in a way that you either could deal with a large scale of objects or you, you could deal with a large scale of users, so provide a access to an unlimited audience or so on. And, well, the most critical point, especially in the archiving and the library communities, well, preservation planning is pretty much, or was pretty much, or still is pretty much unclear. Emulators are software as well, and they are born digital content as well. So they are also prone to the same problems your art pieces or other uh, born digital content is, is prone to digital obsolescence. So, the, the, the question was in, in uh, Geoffrey's talk, uh, so defining of emulation. So, defining emulation is, is a bit a tricky topic because um, you have to define the boundaries. And this is a very diff difficult topic, where you stop emulating and where you start emulating. So, my point is, let's start to look at the complete stack so on top, you have the born digital content, so it's, that's what I abbreviate as BDC, which is either embedded into the system, like it's on your disk, or it's installed as a piece of software or whatever, or it's, it's delivered as an external component, like a CD-ROM or USB or from the network. And then to make use of this, you need a software runtime, so that's software installed, Microsoft Office, or some, some reader rendering application or similar, which itself requires an operating system. So that's the software layer. And there is, there is kind of a bit of air in between, between the, the software layer and the, the hardware layer. Down there, you have hardware. And we actually do not distinguish between real hardware and emulated hardware. Well, because in theory, well, it's, it's similar, or it's the same, actually. So you can, uh, you can, in computer science theory, you can prove that you can, everything which can be programmed can be put into hardware and the other way around. So there is no difference between that. And then you have down there, you have external things like screen or uh, mouse, keyboard, cameras, or whatever you have. So that's, that's the hardware layer. So, Doing preservation on the software layer, well, that's easy. That's uh, simply, yeah, you preserve it as it is. So bit preservation is not rocket science. We are used to that 
for a few years. But this thing is, is more difficult, especially if you want to make it scale. So you can keep the hardware alive, so you have your hardware museum, or you re-implement the hardware either again as hardware or as software. And actually, this is the part we are working on. So we try to deal with especially this part and this part and the combination of that. So this is what we are doing uh, as emulation as a service. In particular, we try to, to build on top of this vast amount of available emulators, kind of a, a convenience layer, so which is required to, to have a modular and a, a scalable service, which you're which is easy to use. So I will show you, I don't go too much into the de technical details, but I have two technical slides. So this is the first slide. That's the basic concepts, what we are working on. The first thing is the emulation component, or that's, that's what we call it. Actually, we don't do, or we don't program any emulator ourselves. So we just take them what we find on the market, on the open source market. And what we do is we put them into a box. So this is, this is the emulator, and it, we put it into a common box. So it's, it's like driving a car. Uh, once you know how to drive a car, it doesn't matter if you drive a Mercedes or a Japanese Toyota. It's, it's just the same concept. And what we do is we unify the, the interfaces from different emulators to, the, to a common concept. So you have a data layer, which allows you to attach user media like floppy CD-ROMs or uh, hard disks, or even networking. Uh, we have an interactive access layer, which allows you to interact with the, the system inside running on the emulator. And we have uh, an API or something, which, which enables you to control the emulator, so start stop, change medium, and similar to interact with that. So that's basically it. And the second thing, what we, what we have done is what we call emulation environment. That's technical metadata. It's just a piece of XML, just consisting of three components, which we distinguish and keep separate. The one, the, the, the lower part, describes the, the hardware environment, so that de describes the, the hardware features. The middle one describes the software environment, that's the software runtime thing. And the top part is the configuration part, that's the user configuration part. And this thing is mapped on the fly to an, uh, to an emulation component. So the hardware descri description is mapped to an appropriate emulator. The software environment is mapped to a, to a disk image, like a virtual hard disk image. And on the configuration part, for instance, we have an object binding like a CD-ROM. So keep it. Well, we ship this as a unit, but we can keep this thing separated. So this has a lot of, so this has a, lot, has a, a few advantages, for instance, we have the hardware environment description, so we know we need a Macintosh computer with, I don't know, with an operating system which is tied to that, running Mac OS 9. So once this emulator is gone, so we need to adapt this disk image, but we know the description, and we can keep this technical metadata as a unit intact. We just change the mapping to a, to a new emulator. And similar, we, we do not want to, to couple disk images and emulators with user objects permanently. So this is a, a, only a, a coupling which happens yeah, for, for specific reasons. So I show you ex examples. So what you have here is a configuration which allows to, to bind a CD-ROM on the fly without changing this disk image. You can, but you don't have to. So to make this a bit more colorful, you all already saw the, the, the most fun examples by Dragon, so I stick with the slides. 
I show you how emulation as a service works at the back end. So how to use the workflows and how to use our software. So this is the example Baruch and the guys from the Flusser Archive uh, showed you yesterday. So this is a computer, a computer photo, uh, a handy photo from, from, the, from this computer, um, this Flusser machine. Uh, Dirk went to Berlin and did a copy of the disk, of the disk, of the hard disk. And now we can start in our workflow. Once we have the copy of the hard disk, we can upload it to an incoming folder, and then it appears here in, in this list. And you choose it, choose this, this disk image, and you choose here kind of a hardware configuration. That's, for instance, that's the wrong choice here, of course. That's a PC, QAMU-based, basic, uh, basic computer, but you can choose to a Basilisk or to a, to a Mac computer. You can switch on CRT simulation or, and other optional things. And you can have here some expert configuration, but that's out of, out of the scope for this, this presentation. So once it renders, um, well, it's, it's available. So what you can do is then, you see the rendering environment in our workflow backend, and you click here on the, on the citation button, and it will produce an HDL link. The, the, the links also Dragon used in his presentation. So you can use this link and embed it, it on your website, on your blog, or whatever. Currently, you can find it on our website as a, as a demo. So it's embeddable and shareable like a YouTube video. But to come back to, to Geoffrey's problem, it cannot be taken away because it's, you can only do screenshots or you can do a screencast, but if you decide in the back end to cut, to cut the wire, uh, it will be gone. So the, the link will be empty and it won't, be, won't appear again. So it's not possible to copy it unless you break into our servers. And what you see here is another button which allows you to modify this environment, to delete files or something, and create a, a der derivative copy of this. So this is, this is useful. So if you have computers which were actually used by humans, uh, there might be, well, sensitive information on that which is not suitable for a public audience, you can redact it, you can remove personal items, and can publish another link to the public version. The, the redacted version can only live with the original version because it's, a, it's only it, the, the, the link of the public version are only the, the deltas you have deleted. So, and any, any unmodified, uh, piece or data is still taken from the original disk. So the next thing is that's the image from the Flusser exhibition. So this is relatively new what we, what we provide. We don't, do not only do the, the, the cloud thing, so you can run it in the cloud, but you can also run the emulators locally. And this is useful if you don't want to pay for cloud computing and you have already local computers like in a reading room or in a museum which, where you have the CPUs available, so you don't have to pay extra money for, for uh, CPUs. But it also allows you to connect external hardware components like gamepad, joysticks, or whatever, which is useful for if you want to, to present games so you don't have a latency, which is, which is a problem in the web and you have a native full screen thing. And you can use it with mock hardware like this nice, uh, really nicely made real Apple monitor which has uh, now a VGA cable <laughs> behind that. And the similar, the keyboard is also kind of a Apple keyboard but it has a USB connector if I remember correctly. <laughs> and the whole thing boots from a USB stick. Um, and this is the tamper-proof museum version. What, you, what we also have is the, is the reading room version. It's 
very similar to the, to the web version. It runs from a USB stick. And you have this, old, this, this, this full screen option. And you can seamlessly switch between the full screen option and the non full screen option. So if in the non full screen, uh, screen option, you can do things like create a citation link or change the medium or whatever. I have actually two sticks as a giveaway. So if you want one, please ask. I only have two because they are expensive. <laughs> it's, our marketing budget is, is really, really. So this, this was dealing with disk images, like whole computers, like the, the Flusser machine. So now um, management of digital objects, like CD-ROMs. I took the, the machine from IMA because they have very, very nice uh, examples there. Um, as a precondition, we assume you already imaged your, your, your CD-ROMs. So that's not rocket science. So you will find an, you Google and you find a solution how to do that. Then these CD-ROMs will be available in our, in our system. And what you can do is then, well, you choose an object, like here, the Billy, Billy Idol uh, floppy, and you choose an environment, like you choose the Sheep Shaver and the Emails Mac OS 7.6. Um, the other option would be don't choose anything here and try your luck. We can characterize the, the object and automatically try to choose an appropriate environment. Uh, what you, if you don't have the things uploaded to our server, we all also allow you to, to paste your, a URL to an HTTP link of, of the ISO, and then you can still use it. So if you click Next here, which is cut away, you will see something like this. So you see the the floppy is injected into the, into the, to the image. Um, it's open. You can click it. You can test it. You can describe it if you like. You can create a screenshot. If you click then next, it's, it's done. It's finished. What we save then, or what, what we generate then, is metadata, which is just a link between this environment, which is untouched, and this object, which is also untouched. So if you click then on, a, on such a HDL link or a link you generated or on, on your website, as, as, as uh, Yves did, um, these two things are just put together on the fly, and they can be curated uh, separately, and they can be maintained separately. So the, the whole preservation planning, the whole preservation thing uh, is completely separated. One, one uh, branch takes care about the object, the other branch takes care about the, the environments. But there is another option, which also uh, Eve is using extensively. Um, so you can create these der derivative environments. So what, what he typically does is he copies this, the, the, the content or links the content to the startup items folder of the, of the of the macOS uh, in a way that it starts automatically. In the back end, this is stored as a, just as a block level difference file. So we do not copy the whole environment. We just store the changes. In this case, this is less than 2 megabytes. So if you want to do that, you have to tick here, keep the customer environment, and you must not forget to shut down the machine. Otherwise, the, the, your users will be greeted with the check disk procedure uh, when you start up the machine. So the result will be this. Uh, it will automatically start. And well, yeah, then you can click again on the site button, and it will generate you a link like that. Well, you have to pay a bit for the HDL. It's about 50 euros or something per, per, per year as a fee. 
Um, if you don't choose the HDL, we can use any link shortener you, you, you think it's appropriate. Well, you already saw this. So we can use the Google Cloud or the Amazon Cloud or any computing backend if you have a great demand uh, on, on customers. So in this we can uh, provide currently 750 sessions in parallel, but it depends on Dragon's or Rhizom's credit card how, ma how many sessions you can actually provide. <coughs> this thing is, is rather cheap still. Uh, one hour of one CPU at the Google Cloud was about five US cents, roundabout. You have to calculate a bit overhead on top of that because we chose to keep a few CPUs spare so the people don't have to wait. If, if, uh, if there are no, no CPUs available, well, we have to start a new machine in the cloud, which takes a bit, so people have to wait. To avoid that, we always keep a, a few CPU spares, which makes your bill a bit more expensive, but it's still, it's about 10 cents per hour per user, so that's still part of the marketing budget, so it's not, not real costs. And the final thing, um, well, Dagan also showed it, well, you have, we have connectivity, um, for instance, you have authentic client access to archived websites. So this is something we are also currently working on. Uh, this nice piece, I, I wanted to create a, a new link, but I forgot, and the internet here is not working so well. This nice piece here is playing MIDI music, which is a bit of, uh, well, really, really computational performance of the past. <laughs> The other part, what we also can do with this, um, we can also preserve complex server setups, which is, or it might be a cost-effective preservation of content management systems, um, because they can react it on demand just by clicking on, on a link. You access, you want to access this web server. It will be started, you have to wait about 30 to 60 seconds until the web server is there, then you can see the, the content of this web server, which is nice, and if the user is gone, the machine is powered down, so no cost at all beside the, the actual storage cost. And you can access this, this preserved web server either with old or with current browser. There's a demo site. Um, that's the URL. Um, you can ask for the password, because we have a lot of operating systems there which are considered as non-free, uh, please ask us for a password. I would put it on the slide, if, but they record this. <laughs> I don't want to see this on, the, on, on YouTube, or this, the password. But uh, if you just ask, uh, we can provide, us, provide you with the password. Um, we provide all this for in-house testing as a as Docker container. You, we have a blog post uh, which describes how you can download and start this whole thing as a Docker container. Um, and you find the source code on GitHub. And of course, yeah, well, you can download also the, the images of the stick if you have your own stick. Um, well, you can copy it to your stick. So this is my, sl my last slide. What are we doing now? Uh, we work on deep citations. So deep citation support, citation of nonlinear objects. Um, we work on benchmarking, so in particular evaluation of emulated object performance, or how does it compare to, to, uh, to, to the real thing. In particular, well, we, we do also work in a, on a scientific level with uh, research data management, so reproducibility is a, is a huge topic right now. Um, what we are working on is uh, complex networked environments like client-server setups, complex client-server setup. Uh, for the reading room, so we, have, we currently work on a reading room appliance, so we need a, kind of a, 
a license enforcement module, and also in the security area. So we we will or we have to extend uh, our shibboleth support, especially for libraries or library support. So that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>